Hello, uh, I'm Rod Phillips and I'm going to moderate this discussion on the panel titled George Ruday, Alfred Coven and beyond. Uh, we've got three speakers uh, today. Uh, first, uh, Doug Munro, who studied as a historian of the Pacific Islands and taught at the University of South Pacific in Fiji. And more recently, he's been doing what he calls telling academic lives, that is focusing on academic controversies, the politics of senior academic appointments, and biographical studies of historians, including George Ruday. Then we have uh, Pamela Pilbeam, Professor Emeritus in French History at Royal Holloway, University of London, and Birkbeck, University of London. And her most recent book is The Saint Simonians in 19th Century France, published by Palgrave in 2014. And then Peter McPhee, who's an Emeritus Professor of History at the University of Melbourne, the author of many works, on 18th and 19th century France. He's published important surveys of the French Revolution and groundbreaking works on the terror, the environment, and the peasantry. Now, this panel examined the contributions of Alfred Carbon and George Roudet to our understandings of the revolution. And I want to start with a couple of questions. Uh, the first question I have is for Pam and Peter, who talk more about the historiography of Roudet and Carbon. Carbon. Uh, Rude and Coven both wrote general explanations of the French Revolution before the plethora of regional studies in the last few decades that had the potential to fracture explanations at the national level. I mean, it's not as if there weren't regional studies before, like Lefebvre's Paysan du Nord. But to what extent did Rude and Coven deal with regionalism in France when explaining the origins and course of the revolution? And how did later work on regionalism? have an impact on their work. So Pam or Peter, either of you start off. Um, I don't mind. Shall, shall I start, Peter, or would you like to? Yes, please, Pam. Yeah. Right, okay. Uh, yeah, Coburn obviously didn't begin um, with writing about regional history at all. And he came to it when he had a Rockefeller scholarship in the 1930s, which allowed him to do research. And he specifically did research in French local archives, in departmental archives. And his aim in that was not to write actually about 1789, but about 1848. Uh, so he worked in quite a number of departmental archives on that project to write a um, a study of, of 1848 uh, and what came out of it were in fact two scholarly articles first of all in the English Historical View, uh, Review in 1942 he wrote a, a study of the constitutional elections in 1848 and in particular of the role of the clergy and the primary school teachers in different departments. So that was one. And then he uh, published in 1952 in the bullet, Bulletin of the English, of the Institute of Historical Research, another study of the elections for the constitutional monarchy, uh, con con sorry, the elections for April 1848 for the constitutional assembly, uh, where he was again working on departmental archives and the work of the um, provisional government and how they operated in the in the department. So that was where he began, but the final book never uh, was never completed. Though after his death, his wife Muriel gave me some of his notes where I could see uh, the departmental archives that he worked in, and I was interested to see that in fact. Uh, one, the Cote d'Or, and others were ones that he sent me to work in when I did my study of 1830. So what Coburn really did from then on was, was encourage his PhD students to do regional studies, very much in the way that um, was being done in France. Uh, though, of course, because a PhD in France was 20 years and not three, uh, what people like, um, you know, Coburn did, did uh, on the Limassan were much more, much more detailed. But you've got Alwyn Hufton, well, Nora Temple to start with, and then Alwyn Hufton, of course, who wrote on Bayeux, uh, and David Higgs, who worked on Toulouse, and I worked on four neighbouring departments in eastern France, which actually had belonged to different 
provinces and I chose them specifically because though they were neighbouring they'd actually been in different departments and I looked at the 1830 revolution then and I went on to write a book on 1830 where in the end I worked in 40 different departmental archives so Cobbin uh, specifically pointed directed uh, students if they were interested to do regional studies and his final student who actually didn't get going with him uh, because he died uh, was Olena Hayward uh, who uh, worked on 1848 uh, in a a, a regional context and completed a thesis and later with her husband wrote an article on 1848. So Cobbin was extremely enthusiastic about um, the, the way in which French history should be studied uh, locally and regionally and of course very much in uh, archives which he was intent upon students using. So I think that's probably my answer to that question. Anything else you'd like to ask me, Rod, about that? No, no, that, uh, that sounds very good. Uh, Peter, how about um, Rude? Oh, I, I think uh, one of the shortcomings of Rude's overall analysis of the, the French Revolution is that the uh, rural France and the peasantry are, uh, are there, but they're very much bit players. And certainly when he did his major surveys, he, you know, he's very perfunctory really about the Vendée, for example, just refers to it in passing. Uh, and even though he uh, obviously had a very solid background in understanding the nature of rural society because of his um, the mentorship of Georges Lefebvre, he himself wasn't particularly interested. He wrote some very good studies about uh, about rural protest during the revolution and and later um, later as well. He started to read some of the uh, the social history that was being produced in the 1970s. Such he was very taken with Maurice Agoulon, but certainly in terms of any type of, uh, any type of awareness of, of regional differences, of regionalism, uh, of, of, of ethnic minorities, of linguistic difference. No, he had very little, uh, if, any, if anything, to say about that. Um, he was mainly interested, of course, in urban society. And I suspect that underneath his comparative lack of interest in the countryside, was uh, a certain Marxist uh, assumption about the peasantry as the awkward class, <laughs> that, um, th that they were both um, doomed to uh, disappear in a sense, and yet uh, the history of the French peasantry is also one of great protest and, and revolutionary mobilisation at times. Um, but uh, George was obviously more comfortable or most comfortable when he's talking about uh, urban, urban protest. And certainly you would say that in terms of his overviews of the French Revolution, uh, that um, uh, it's a significant weakness in the way that he approached the history of the French Revolution. Right. Do you think that, do, I mean, do you think that later, later work on regionalism is, is one of the, um, you know, has, has to some extent un undermined the, the, uh, the, the, the work then? Well, um, you know, on the other hand, um, you know, Georges George Lefebvre, who was his great master, after all had said, we have to understand this as, as a bourgeois and peasant revolution. Um, I was a good friend of George. Uh, you know, he was a great mentor to me. And he was very encouraging with my work, that, which, like Alfred Coppen, <laughs> began with 1848. Um, and, you know, George was very interested in the regional studies I was doing of the, the history of the, the peasantry. And certainly he thought that um, what Agulon and Corbin and others was finding was extremely interesting as social history, which it was. Um, but it's just that uh, he himself, by the time he really bec became aware of it, uh, was already um, at a point where he was reaching retirement uh, and he, he didn't really follow up that sort of work himself. Right, right. Just uh, move on and bring and bring Doug in. Doug, Doug's Actually, paper was. Let me sorry. go back a minute yep. because I've forgotten two very important Cobbin students, and they, and they would shoot me if I didn't mention them. Um, uh, at the end of his career, uh, Cobbin was supervising uh, Tim Legoff and 
Donald Sutherland, who actually finished their thesis after he died. But they, of course, were working on Western France and on the peasantry and regional studies. Uh, and so uh, this was very much following up uh, the, the, uh, the departmental and regional direction in which research was so abundantly being uh, produced and proceeded within France itself at the time. So uh, Don Sutherland, who later, of course, uh, wrote a book on the uh, history of the revolution, and Tim Le Goff, who worked on also on the um, on Western France and on the peasantry, must be mentioned in very close context with Coburn, even though uh, Coburn died before they had completed. I'm very sorry. No, I'm no, very no. sorry, Tim. I'm very sorry, Don. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, just to, to bring, uh, to bring uh, Doug in, Doug's uh, paper was mainly uh, about the biography, the academic biography of, uh, of, uh, of George Roudet. And I just wanted to ask uh, you this question, Doug, that uh, George Roudet was variously fired and uh, blacklisted for being a member of the British Communist Party. And for all, all we know, his his career was affected in other ways as well. Uh, but between the 1930s and 1950s, a number of British historians identified as Marxist, even if they didn't join the, uh, the Communist Party. I wonder if Rude's experiences were typical or atypical, and I wonder whether you think they influenced his historical perspectives at all. Well, it's difficult to say how uh, typical or atypical um, they were. It was Eric Hobsbawm who made the point that um, after the Berlin um, airlift, it was very difficult indeed for a communist to get a uh, job in a British university. Edward Thompson did, and there was an educationalist whose name I just can't remember. They managed to get jobs because their uh, heads of department uh, wanted a, a variegated department, and uh, you know they wanted their token Marxist, you might say. So uh, they were they were quite lucky. Uh, what happened with George uh, getting? Well, uh, this is from St. Paul's School, where he was teaching in London, where he was teaching modern languages. Well, it's a fairly long and involved story. Um, wasn't so much that he was sacked, he was let go. Because a horrified pa parent of one of the pupils saw him with a communist uh, party placard in the street, reported it uh, to the board, and uh, George was told that... Uh, uh, to either um, give up his communism or um, or leave the school, and it was really it appears to have been quite an amicable discussion, and it was agreed that he would uh, leave in good order. And I think he might have actually it might have been um, a blessing in disguise because it enabled him gave him the time to complete his PhD thesis. In the following year, which was 1950, he got a job at another school. Um, he went from a public school to a grammar school. It was uh, Sir Walter St. John's School in South um, London. And uh, then he got another job at Holloway School, which was a comprehensive school. So George was going ever downhill. Ooh. As far as the, uh, what was the matter, Pam? <laughs> Is no, not sad. Hey? Good school. It was a it was a boys it was a boys school about thirteen hundred students from ages um, eleven to nineteen, but uh, I was saying in the prestige stakes. I mean, going from a private school down to a comprehensive school. I, I mentioned this because I got a rather unpleasant. Uh, email when I was doing my research on George that uh, said that he was just a champagne socialist who taught in public schools, that is in English, uh, private schools all his life. And the reason we, but the reason we know about this was because when he um, was being considered for the job at the University of Adelaide, um, the university inquired with the Association of Universities of the Commonwealth that uh, they were asked to investigate George's communism, and so he was interviewed by them, and uh, they were satisfied. Although he was a communist, um, he didn't. Uh, 
the check with the schools and he didn't preach communism in the classroom or in the staff room. And he got the job through the good offices of uh, Hugh Stretton, the professor at Adelaide with whom he became, they became very close friends. But the effect that it had on his career, I don't think it was much because uh, George was not the sort of person to hold grudges. The, what, I think it was the, um, the Battle of Cable Street, 1936, that, uh, that had more of an effect because here he was in one of the, uh, the demonstrations that he later wrote about. I think it gave him an affinity with the crowd and also the realization that the uh, law and order, that they were the villains of the peace, not the poor protesters. I mean, the Battle of Table Street was um, when Sir Walter Mosley's uh, black shirts um, were allowed to march through um, the, the, the Jewish areas of um, London, and they were met with um, with a vociferous uh, response. And of course, there were mounted police. And George was careless enough to get arrested, fined five pounds, which must have been a week's salary in those days. And he was always he, he was all, always rather scared of police mounted policemen after that. With, uh, you know, they were wielding their batons with gay abandon. I've seen some of the clips of the battle. And when it came to the uh, uh, anti-Vietnam, the big uh, anti-Vietnam war demonstration in Adelaide, uh, George was uh, not sure where he was, but he was certainly well away from the uh, police, but uh, the mounted police. But I think it was the um, a decisive influence, intellectual influence on George was the, his involvement in the Battle of Cable Street, in addition, of course, to uh, reading the Marxist classics. And uh, I suspect the reason that he took a second degree at the University of London in history was so that history would give them a, a better appreciation of, um, of, uh, of Marxism. Thanks. Thank you, David. Thank you. Do any of you have questions for for the others or another? I w would like to put Peter a question, if I may. Yes, sure. Yeah, um, uh, your, your paper's really lucid. It's a, a superb statement. I wondered if you'd like to say a bit more about, um, clearly there were many uh, personal contacts and uh, intellectual context. How many PhD students did Rude have? Did he have PhD students or did he have informal? Code? What was his personal influence? Uh, when I think about Coburn, it, it, the students are enormously important. They were important to him and they they were important you know, sort of carrying on in the study of history, not necessarily following in the direction Coburn went, but they were important. And I wondered how important you thought this was in uh, for Rude, because when you think about it, with the Rude seminar, uh, the biennial Rude seminar, you could say that his the the continuity of Rude and his influence is massive. I mean, for Coburn, yeah, there's a uh, there's a research seminar still at the Institute of Historical Research, but that's tiny, tiny compared with the Rude, especially this year, of course. But compared with the every two years Rude. Uh, seminar. So um, can you talk a bit about one, his PhD students and one, the extent to which you think he had a personal direct influence on individual academics? Um, I, when Rude uh, got his first job at the University of Adelaide in, in 1960, as, as Doug uh, has pointed out very well, we have to remember that he was already uh, 50 years old. Uh, and he was prodigiously uh, productive during during that decade of the of the 60s, uh, and that was at a time when the University of Adelaide had very few uh, graduate students. One of the few of them was a man named Bill Murray, who was a <laughs> wrote a very good book about the right wing press during the French Revolution. He then went on to study his great passion, which was the history of English and Scottish soccer. Um, <laughs> But it was more when George went to Canada that he developed a, a cohort of graduate students who produced um, a very nice book of essays at the time of his retirement. I think one of the reasons why George um, developed such a, 
a standing was partly because the, the, the crowd was such a famous book, uh, but also George was quite a charismatic character. You know, I'm not saying that Alfred Coppin wasn't. He obviously was a, a, a man who was dedicated to his, t his teaching and to his students. Um, George was an extraordinarily courteous and generous person. I remember my first contact with George really was um, when I did some tutoring for him as a, a, a young PhD graduate and had the temerity to show him the first article that I'd written or to, or to send it to him. And he, he obviously read it immediately and wrote back to me. And I was astonished that such a famous person would, uh, would stoop to doing that. And he was just a very kind, generous man who we found inspirational as a teacher. He was sort of the sort of person that you felt like saying as a young academic, I, I hope I can be a bit like that one day. Uh, I mean, he was so articulate and eloquent and, and generous. Um, but, you know, I, I dare say that because of the age difference, Pam, that he didn't have quite the influence on generations of, of students in the way that Alfred Cobbin did through his seminar. Sorry. I don't know, would you agree with that, Doug? Yeah, could I, I was just about to say, could I chime in? I mean, you're quite right, Peter, that uh, when George went to um, Adelaide in 1960, it was a time when, you know, the department was producing, it wasn't until the 70s that the department was really starting to produce PhD students, and even then it was a trickle. Yep. Um, one of the reasons that George was uh, appointed was that Hugh Stretton um, saw a copy of the crowd in history in, in draft form and thought, you know, I've got to get this guy. And the second reason was that he was a school teacher and Hugh reckoned that he would be an ideal teacher for the big first year classes, which he was. Um, when, when George went to Flinders University towards the end of 1968, and he was there till 1971, I was there at the time. Uh, there would have been no; he would have had no PhD student there. Yeah. The, yeah. the university was very new. Um, if you were going to be a PhD student, you had to come from another university, and uh, you just didn't get one. And uh, yes, when he went to Canada, that's when he started to uh, get the PhD students. His, um, so, um, um, did how many students did Cobham normally have in his? in his uh, seminar that you refer to? Yeah, when I, I was attending the seminar, there would be perhaps uh, around the table each Monday about eight people who were yeah. all, all PhD students. Yes, yes. Uh, that he didn't have sort of other people attending. It was purely a, uh, a, a seminar for PhD students. And he was also very careful only to recruit students who he th thought he'd be able to get a job for. He, he calculated that sort of thing very carefully. And I remember when I graduated, someone else who did Cobbin's special subject, uh, um, Richard Sims, uh, also said he'd like to do French history. And Cobbin said, no, uh, uh, go and do Franco-Japanese relations. Uh, and he did, and he became a, a Japanese expert at, at SOAS, and that went very well. But Cobbin was always very careful not to... Uh, take on students who he, you know, too many students, so that he would find not be able to find them jobs. He, he was. It's very interesting. The whole question, Rod, of the um, relationship between Cobbin and Rude, because they were they had such a different um, overview of the French Revolution, um, and yet, you know, they obviously, in in many ways, uh, kept a very significant respect for each other. I mean, it's interesting mm. that in the in the Feshrift volume that John Boscher edited um, in honour of Alfred Cobbin that George wrote an essay for it. Right. Uh, yeah. And even though in his, uh, in his final book uh, on the French Revolution, you know, George, um, there's some very lovely uh, descriptions of Cobbin. Um, they're, not, they're not cruel. They're not cruel. And uh, George just wasn't that sort of person in any case. Uh, he, you know, he was such a, a courteous person. And when I, I spoke to him endlessly about, um, you know, his upbringing and his work as an historian and so on, he was always very careful to be respectful 
and he'd occasionally get a twinkle in his eye and have a little bit of a dig. But um, I know that Doug has come across some um, letters about George Ruday uh, by other very prominent historians, which are extremely unpleasant. Uh, but George wasn't that sort of person. Right. And I don't think Alfred Cobham was either. Right. Um, you know, they, I don't think either of them had that particularly sort of uh, snippety edge that some of our colleagues can have. <laughs> no, and I think, that, I think that's quite interesting, really, because, uh, of course, I was a student of Richard Cobb. That's right. Uh, and that's quite a different story. <laughs> but, 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 you know, I, I was at a, just a, a small anecdote, I was at a party in London in 1973 when I was just starting my, uh, my research with Richard Cobb. And, uh, and someone came up to me, I won't identify him, and uh, came up to me and said, I hear you're, you're, you're doing a doctorate in French history. And I said, yes. And he introduced himself, and it was one of uh, Coven's students, quite well known. And he said, so who are, you doing your, who are you doing your research with? And I said, Richard Cobb. And he said, oh, and walked away. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not pursue who that was then. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, they, they do seem to have had, had a respectful relationship that, uh, you know, which, in which the academic disagreements didn't translate into personal antagonism. That's right, yeah. Yes, I think that um, George's historiographical reflections were always uh, very measured, actually, and, and polite. Right. Um, but I do think that he, you know, he had a, a very, very significant uh, impact on the way that a, a, genera a whole generation of students went about trying to write social history from below. I mean, I, I do remember vividly when I was a, a third year undergraduate student and I, I bought a copy of The Crowd and the French Revolution uh, and the excitement of being able to read because uh, I, I, I was able to read the French quotes in the book, quotations from people in the crowd. Uh, I just felt for the first time in my life that I was somehow uh, in touch with uh, the world of ordinary people who'd made the, the French Revolution. And um, I mean, it's a, it must seem an odd thing to say now, but at, but at that time, particularly in the context of the upheavals of 1968, uh, it was a very it was very exciting to encounter this way of doing history, right. and I think that there were there was a whole generation of people who were inspired by by Rude and his cohort. Even though today uh, we would look at uh, the way they, that he wrote about uh, crowds and violence, and uh, want to do so in a rather different way. But we would still. Uh, suggest that students, my, my graduate students, when we're talking on this theme, um, uh, they start off with Rude. They, they read Rude and uh, find it extremely uh, um, exhilarating to read his work. So it's not finished at all in terms of no, uh, no. student interest. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Oh, I, think, I think that's right. I mean, my, my students love reading Rude. Mm. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I, they find it they find it as exciting as as I did when I first as I first read it. I mean, it's, it's just good history and 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 so engagingly written as well. Mm. And going back to what Doug was saying about Rude at the uh, at the University of Adelaide, I can remember talking to uh, some of his colleagues at the time. We found it so frustrating that every morning George would appear. This is the day when, of course, there were people in the office did the typing. Every morning, George would appear with a, another chapter uh, of his handwriting, and he obviously, <laughs> after, after dinner, had simply sat down and said, "I'd better write another chapter of a book." <laughs> and uh, he would appear with this, you know, immaculately written, handwritten uh, set of foolscap pages and hand them to the office typist. And he did that day after day. I mean, it, he produced uh, seven or eight books in that decade. It was really quite extraordinary. Right. But he could also switch off. I mean, yeah. he got up early in the morning to do his, uh, to start his writing. I mean, the story goes that his wife, Doreen, was once asked, well, you've got such a happy marriage, and they had an uncommonly happy marriage. And uh, somebody said, how do you do it? And uh, she said, oh, we never had breakfast together, because George <laughs> was uh, do doing his writing. And staff at the University of Adelaide had come in and they could smell his French, uh, his, uh, 
something else. Cool was. Yeah, yeah. And, they could, and uh, he, he was, uh, and also he was a very efficient marker. Yeah. He could read, he, he, and at the end he would uh, write, write a paragraph and uh, sort of got through it quickly, efficiently, and fairly. And, uh, and uh, Hugh Stratton pointed this out in an, in an interview that he did. And it was Hugh that got him the second chair to yeah. Adelaide. And one uh, of the things we need to bear in mind about him. Teacher, he was a school teacher one year, and six years or five years later, he was a full professor. That's right. But he quite deliberately, I used to ask him um, whether he was going to do more original research in the archives. Uh, rather than uh, write textbooks. And he actually said to me, look, one of the reasons I do this is that um, I've had a very short academic career because I didn't start it until I was 50. And I'm always worried that if I die young, that uh, I won't be able to leave enough money uh, for Doreen. And he said, I have to keep in mind that I need to sell a lot of books, which he did. And that's one reason why, you know, after the crowd and the French Revolution, uh, the, the, the range of work he did in the archives was quite limited, in fact. You know, he was mainly writing overviews thereafter. And yeah. some of those overviews, uh, I thought you might have mentioned in your paper, Doug, that um, Cobbin uh, encouraged Rude to write uh, a historical a historical association pamphlet, which was published uh, in, in 1961, uh, which was the interpretations of the French Revolution. It yeah. was a replacement for Cobbin's own historical association pamphlet, which he'd published in 1946. And it was Rude he asked to write it. Um, and this was published, it's actually still in print. And it, he was the only one of Cobbin's students who Cobbin honored with that, um, uh, appreciation of writing a historical association pamphlet. Coven, of course, was editing them. And he also was very involved with the New Cambridge Modern History. And Coven wrote chapters in a volume of the New Cambridge Modern History. And he invited Rude to also write a chapter in the next volume of the New Cambridge Modern. And Rude was one of two Cobbin students who contributed to that volume. The other was uh, was John Bosher. So Cobbin uh, clearly did what he could in terms of where he was editing and publishing uh, to encourage Rude to uh, to contribute, um, and that's what that's worth remembering. Yeah, and also George uh, George's first um, major article in an English journal was in the uh, bulletin of the. Uh, the Institute of Historical Research, yeah, um, and that was on the, the motivation to protest, um, and it was Cobbin who who was behind that too. We're pretty sure. Yeah. So it went back a lot. So it went back to 1953, actually. Okay. Cobbin helping uh, uh, Arude, and, and then when Hungary happened, uh, George was uh, dismissed from the uh, seminar. And then all the rumours spread that he was blackballed uh, by Cobham for a uh, university position, which we both rather doubt because, uh, I mean, what jobs were there going? Mm. I mean, that's, a, that's one thing. Um, you know, the, the, the evidence just isn't there. Mm. Uh, and certainly when I did Cobham's special subject, Rude's Crowd was a book that Cobham uh, insisted that we all read. Even, even though they had quite different, uh, coming into it from quite different political perspectives. Good. Well, this has been a very interesting discussion. It's always interesting, I think, to uh, dig into the sort of the uh, behind the scenes of um, our historical writing in uh, various ways. I, 60 seconds to, uh, to uh, make any final points, if any of you would like. I'd like to do that? My, uh, my only final point is that I think that uh, neither Cobbin nor Rude, for very different reasons, um, uh, made enough of the significance of the end of seigneurialism uh, and of land sales uh, and of changes in the very nature of property itself 
uh, as one of the consequences of the, of the French Revolution. Um, George tended to brush over the abolition of, uh, of feudalism much too briefly. And I think uh, Cobbin, because he argued that really the feudal regime was dead and buried before 1789 anyway, didn't think that the French Revolution was such a cataclysmic event for the countryside. Uh, and where I and other rural historians today would disagree with both of them actually, uh, is seeing the, um, the rural face of the revolution as being much more, much more profound and significant than either of them would have allowed. Okay. Thanks. And yet, the translation of uh, Cobbins' book, Le Son de la Révolution Française, which was published in 1984, Le Relat Durie, in making the introduction to the book, stressed Cobbins as emphasis upon the peasantry. Uh, yeah. uh, so, you know, that was the way Le, Le Relat Durie interpreted Cobbins' um, message. Yeah, well, I'd just like to end on a personal note. It's not just simply that George was a, he was a very nice and pleasant and decent man, but he was also very honourable and he stuck by his principles and he also undertook his obligations. Mm. And I have very fond memories of him. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Doug, Pam and, and Peter, it's been an excellent uh, chat. And uh, I hope you uh, hope you stay well. And, uh, and it's lovely to it's lovely to be with three other colleagues, all in in different parts of the world. I know <laughs> different parts of the world and different time zones. Different times. <laughs> yeah. And Rod, thank thank you very much for getting up so early for us. <laughs> That's right. And uh, a for pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Session. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, everybody. Okay. Bye bye. Hey, Rod. Thanks. Bye bye, everyone. Bye. Yeah. Bye, Pam. Th thanks, Doug. <laughs>